We're going to be talking in this episode about the battle of the camel or the incident of the camel. And we said last time that uh, after the killing of Uthman, anhu, uh, many of the Sahaba felt really that it was a massive uh, act of injustice and they wanted to bring the killers of Uthman uh, to justice. Uh, Ali bin Abi Talib became the caliph and the Sahaba gave him bay'ah. They pledged allegiance to him. And they were waiting for Ali to take some action and to bring the killers of Uthman to justice. However, Ali bin Abi Talib was busy and he was saying to everybody, just wait because I need to uh, attend to certain urgent things, uh, urgent matters of state. But some of the Sahaba, they felt that too much time was going by and that the, um, uh, that the killers of Uthman would get away with it. Uh, and some of those were Aisha radiallahu anha, Talha and Zubair. And of course, also Muawiyah, okay, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan and the Banu Umayyah. They were also very upset that uh, things had gotten so bad that their kinsman, Uthman bin Affan, the great Sahabi, uh, the caliph, could have been uh, assassinated in such a brutal way and his killers not brought to justice. So it was in that uh, environment, in that context, that uh, Talha bin Ubaidillah and Az Zubair bin Al Awam, who had been married to Aisha radiallahu anha's sisters, you know, Zubair was married to, uh, to Asma, uh, and uh, Talha was married to Umm Kulthum, Aisha radiallahu anha's youngest uh, sister. Uh, and they were the fathers of her nephews and nieces. They came to Mecca, where Aisha radiallahu had completed her hajj, and she was just waiting for peace to come to Medina. And they encouraged Aisha radiallahu to come with them to Basra. They would march to Basra, and they wanted Aisha radiallahu and her, especially in her hodaj, on her camel, to be like a symbol that would encourage the Muslims to support their cause, a calling for justice and calling for revenge uh, from those who had assassinated Uthman. So <clears throat> news spread fast that Aisha anha was going to be part of an army or a march to restore peace and justice within the Islamic lands. The leaders of Banu Umayyah, they also joined this army. Now remember that our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she did not have political experience before this. She was seen as a very pure figure, a symbol. She was the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so when the Muslims saw this army or this, these people marching <clears throat> towards Basra, and they saw that our mother Aisha and her Hodaj were part of that caravan, then men from far and near began to pour into that army. They all wanted to join. And so although they had started off with, say, 600 people, by the time they reached Basra, there were about, there were tens of thousands, some say 30,000. So it ended up being a very uh, strong force. Now on the way to Basra, and the reason why they were going to Basra is because they believed that the killers of Uthman were being hidden or were hiding in Basra. On the way, they passed a, an oasis where the neighborhood dogs started to howl and bark. Now our mother Aisha radila anha suddenly heard the, the sound of this barking and she remembered a prophecy from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he had said to her, I don't know which one of you will be barked at by the dogs of Ho'ab. And this had been uh, a comment by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his wives and it was seen as a negative thing, you know, that something negative was going to happen. Um, and 
Aisha Radilanha remembered this and she quickly asked the people around her what the name of this oasis was where they had stopped. And they replied and said that this was the oasis of Ho'ab. She immediately froze and demanded that they go back. But Talha and Zubair, uh, they pleaded with her that this was a just cause. And so after a long discussion back and forth and much against her will, uh, they continued marching to Basra. But you can see that already our mother Aisha, she had a, a bad feeling about this and she realized that it was probably going to be a mistake. The governor of Basra, Uthman bin Hanif, he noticed, of course, that this massive army was approaching his city and he didn't want to allow them in. And so he sent a deputation to Aisha radila anha. She, he wanted to know what the purpose of her campaign was. And he came out with a small army uh, to stop them entering the city. Talha and Zubair came out to address the governor's army and there was an uproar and there was a little bit of fighting that went on at that time as well. Seeing this, Aisha radila anha stepped forward and as soon as she began to speak, everyone fell silent. Such was the status of Aisha, the person closest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone, no matter who or what side they were part of, they remained silent as she spoke and they listened to what she had to say. At the end of her speech, she said, listen very carefully. The thing you should do now and which it would be improper to ignore is to arrest the assassins of Uthman bin Affan and strictly enforce the commandments of Allah. The effect of her speech was so spectacular that the governor's army, even those who were with Uthman bin Hanif, the governor of Basra, many of them went over to the side of Aisha radlana. So her army ended up being 30,000 strong. And there was a stalemate for a few days while the gov because the governor was not allowing them to enter Basra. Ali bin Abi Talib, anhu, he wanted to keep order in his caliphate and he told the governor not to submit to the army of Aisha. But eventually, uh, the army of Aisha did enter Basra and they found many of the killers of Uthman and they were executed. Ali was very disturbed by the news that Basra had been overtaken by this army. He felt that he had to go and confront the army before dealing with other problems that he was facing. And so he appealed to the people of Medina to help him, but the response was quite minimal. He left Medina with only 700 men but it is said that more and more men joined him on his way to Basra. And so as many as 7,000 men, for example, joined him from Kufa, uh, which is near Basra. He reached Basra with about 20,000 men. And so we had these two camps, these two armies. Uh, Aisha radila anha came out to meet Ali or to have discussions with the people who Ali Radilan who sent uh, to have discussions. For the first time in Islamic history, two Muslim armies were standing against each other in battle. The thought of the potential battle happening between relatives, kinsmen, brothers and sisters in Islam, it made the hearts of many of the sincere Muslims bleed with sheer sorrow and sadness. Zubair was said to have cried out in disgust. Alas, after becoming powerful, the Muslims are now out to shatter their own power. The vast majority of the people there hoped with all their hearts that the clash would be averted. Ali radiallahu anhu was um, sending deputations to Aisha radiallahu camp in order to have peace talks. 
Ali was delighted with the idea of peace talks because he did not want there to be any conflict or bloodshed between Muslims. So he sent delegates to, uh, to the other camp. Zubair and Talha also explained their position in this dispute to the delegates. And they explained that their aim was simply to punish the murderers of Uthman. The delegates replied, O oh mother of the believers, please consider your position carefully. So they were encouraging Aisha anha to now leave. Uh, they said, you know, in order to punish 500 men, you might shed the blood of 5,000. And then the relatives of those 5,000 will cry for revenge. In other words, they said to our mother Aisha and to the, uh, to the group that were with her, that this will all spiral out of control. And so Aisha anha, of course, who wanted peace and who didn't want there to be a conflict, agreed. And they decided that there would be no conflict and the peace talks were continuing. This also made Ali anha, very happy. And so he sent out a declaration announcing that he will settle the dispute the next day. And that those who were in any way involved in Uthman's murder were to leave his army, okay? Because that was one of the conditions. This deeply unsettled the very people who were banking on the hope that they were safe in Ali's camp. So as we said earlier, some of the people who had been involved, the mob that had been involved in the killing of Uthman, some of them had hidden or were absorbed into the army of Ali. But when he said that they must all leave, and when they saw that there was going to be peace, they became very upset. After the break, we will look at what happened when those people became angry and the trouble that they caused which ended in a clash between Muslims and a lot of bloodshed. Jazakumullah khairan. Welcome back. Now, we said that the people who had been involved with the killing of Uthman, some, some of them had been absorbed into the army, army of Ali, and they were very upset when they saw that Ali radiallahu anhu was making peace with um, the camp of Aisha radiallahu anha. And when he said to them that anyone who had been involved in Uthman's murder was to part company with his army. Now, they decided to cause trouble. And as the night came in, those people who had been involved in Uthman radiallahu anhu's murder prepared a surprise attack while everyone in both camps were asleep. Just before dawn, they launched an attack on Aisha's camp, which ignited fighting on both sides. So, you know, they killed some people from one camp and then they killed some people on, in the other camp. So either each of the camps thought that the other had been treacherous. And so skirmishes turned into full-blown battle. Ali and Aisha were both horrified and tried to stop the fighting. The Qadi, the judge of Basra, Ka'ab ibn Thawr, he suggested that because Aisha anha was such a symbolic figure and her camel and hodaj were so widely recognized, that Aisha anha should take her camel right into the thick of the battle. And that way, her hodaj would be there for everyone to see and it would bring the Muslims back to their senses and to stop fighting. Thousands and thousands of people lost their lives in this clash. And it was utter chaos. Um, no matter how much Aisha anha and Ali tried to stop the fighting, they couldn't. Ali took one last opportunity to attempt for peace and he called out for Zubair, who was fighting on Aisha anha's side, and said, Zubair, <clears throat> don't you remember the messenger of Allah telling you that one day you would fight against me and it would be an unjust cause? <clears throat> Zubair anhu 
heard the calls and immediately remembered what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said and he stopped fighting and he walked away from the battle uh, but unfortunately he was killed Talha also was killed as he was trying to leave the battle the army with Aisha anha, was losing the battle and they formed a human wall around her hodaj. Now, <clears throat> I said that uh, the Qadi of Basra had uh, asked Aisha anha, why don't you take your camel to the middle of the battle and it would bring, bring people to their senses. And so that's what Aisha anha, did. Ali's side decided to throw down Aisha radila and his camel. And it, they did this, of course, they didn't do this, take this decision lightly. They wanted to do something that would be very striking and very kind of symbolic so that people would be brought to their senses and the battle would stop. So they, they cut off <clears throat> the legs, the hind legs of the camel on which our mother Aisha radila anha was. The camel came crashing down, bringing Aisha radila anha in her hodaj down with it. Sure enough, the fighting immediately ceased. You can just imagine, you know, uh, the Muslims asking themselves, what has come of us? when the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is brought down in a battle comes crashing down you know the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam must have been a very very striking and painful moment for everyone so our mother Aisha anha was still in her hodaj but of course it had fallen and her brother Muhammad bin Abi Bakr, who was with the camp of Ali, he came rushing towards his sister's hodaj and he put his hand inside the hodaj to help her step out. At first she said, whose insolent hand is this? And then when he told her that it was a brother, she, <clears throat> um, she came out and she was taken to safety. Ali radiallahu anhu also arrived to ensure that she was safe. Ali, like all of the fellow companions and Muslims, treated Aisha radiallahu anha with the utmost respect. After she had a suitable rest for a few days after the battle, Ali radiallahu anhu sent her to, back to Medina um, in the company of her brother, Muhammad bin Abi Bakr, and his own family members. And Ali and his son, uh, Hassan, they actually accompanied uh, them also for many miles before bidding them farewell. Aisha radila anha addressed the people and she said, O oh believers, there is no enmity between me and Ali. It was merely a misunderstanding. <clears throat> I consider Ali a very good man. When people started spreading rumors about tensions between Ali and Aisha anha, she said, my children, unfortunately, we hurt one another. We experienced upsetting incidents and became very tired. After this moment, no one should look at each other with malice or fight about what happened or the wrong statements others made. Surely there is no problem between me and Ali more than the normal matter that exists between a woman and her in-laws. He is the most auspicious man for whom I wish goodness and well-being. Ali radila anhu said, she is telling the truth and how beautifully she has expressed it. Surely she is the wife of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this life and in the hereafter. When our mother Aisha radila anha left Basra, she first went to Mecca during the Hajj season and then finally returned to Medina. She had gone to Iraq, to Basra, with nothing but good intentions. Her aim had been to mend matters, to make things better and to bring uh, 
uh, evildoers to justice. But looking back, Aisha's uh, heart was full of regret. That journey to Iraq, in hindsight, seemed nothing short of the greatest tragedy so far in Islamic history, and certainly in her lifetime. Her own sister, Umm Kulthum, was widowed. Her sister Asma's uh, ex-husband, Az-Zubair, was martyred. And thousands of women were widowed as a result of her campaign. Our mother Aisha considered her involvement in that campaign to be the biggest mistake of her life. But after the incident of the camel, which we said our mother Aisha regretted, she returned to Medina and it must have been a time of great soul searching for her. And, you know, she used to always remember the verse of Quran, especially the verses addressed to the mothers of the believers in Surah Al-Ahzab. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in uh, chapter 33, verse 33, Remain in your homes and do not display your beauty as it used to be displayed in the days of ignorance. And establish the salah and pay the zakah and obey Allah and his messenger. Allah only intends to keep all sorts of filth away from you, O members of the family, meaning the wives of the Prophet wasallam, especially, and to make you pure through a perfect purification. Whenever she heard these verses, she would cry. And she had wished that she had stayed at home during that entire campaign. But our mother Aisha عنها, didn't allow this sense of tragedy or this regret to break her. She spent time in introspection. She must have spent time soul searching. And it seems that she asked herself the question that each and every one of us need to ask ourselves. How can we truly be of service to Allah? What is our legacy going to be? What is it that we should be doing with our lives that would be most pleasing to Allah? Perhaps the verse of Quran addressed to the mothers of the believers struck her as being a calling. Uh, the verse that says, وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ لَطِيفًا خَبِيرًا And remember, and remember what is recited in your homes of the signs of Allah, the ayat of Allah, and hikmah, the sunnah. Surely Allah has been ever kind, ever cognizant. It seems that our mother Aisha عنها, really took these verses to heart because in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the wives of the Prophet وسلم, to be attached to their homes and to recite the verses of Allah's words and to teach hikmah and to remember and teach hikmah. And al-hikmah here, wisdom, uh, refers to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, were the ones who knew about the sunnah very, very closely and very, very intimately. So it seems that our mother Aisha found this to be her calling. She decided to devote the rest of her life to doing what this ayah of the Quran told her to. From her home, she would recite and teach the verses of Allah's book and she would teach the hikmah, the sunnah. Her calling was to preserve and convey the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she, she turned her home into a center of learning. She turned away from direct political involvement and even when Ali bin Abi Talib was killed, although she was very upset, and she sent messages of rebuke to Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, عنه, she continued to advise and correct and exhort the Caliph Muawiyah during his caliphate, but she didn't get involved in any political matters. Instead, 
she took on orphans under her wing as students. Uh, many of them were her own nephews and nieces who had been orphaned. Inshallah, in the next episode, we will look at the school of our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, who were her students and what was her role as a scholar. جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك <تصفيق>